Watchman of Ephraim here. Hey, guess what this video is going to be on? This concerns the Trinity, which is a false doctrine. Uh, this uh, particular video is going to be on Genesis 1 1. Got a little bit of, bit of a debate with a Trinitarian a little while ago. He threw at me Genesis 1 1. Here's proof. God Elohim is plural. So there must be three gods in one, or one god in three, or whatever. Do not be carried away by strange and diverse doctrines. Everything man does is strange. This is religion. This is part of Mystery Babylon, and we are commanded to come out of Mystery Babylon in these last days. So what I want to do is share a, a little article that explains Genesis 1.1. It's a really good article. Give scriptures and you can scriptures will pop up as I as I read them so you can understand. We want to look at this word Elohim and how it is applied and it's applied in different ways in your Bible. And Trinitarians will try to take advantage of it to try to prove to you that God is one in three, three in one. This even applies to Binotarians who try to say that Yeshua Jesus is God. There's only one God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Going on here, <clears throat> excuse me, the word God is Elohim. My mouth is like real dry. I've been drinking buckets of water, still can't get it. It's dry. Okay, once again, the word God, Elohim, which is is itself a plural form and, like most other words, has more than one definition. It is used in a plural sense of, quote-unquote, gods, or men with authority, and in a singular sense for God, quote-unquote, uh, small g, capital G, small g, God, or a man with authority, such as a judge. So you could pull up Strong's concordance on your computer or, or look up Elohim and you'll see it means judge, mighty ones, God, capital G, uppercase, lowercase, God, gods. The Hebrew lexicon by Brown, Driver, and Briggs, considered to be one of the best available, has as its first usage for Elohim rulers, judges, either as divine representatives at sacred places or as reflecting divine ma majesty and power. Divine ones, superhuman beings, including God and angels, gods. Elohim is translated, quote-unquote, gods in many verses. Genesis 35, 2. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods, Elohim, you have with you, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Get rid of all the foreign gods you have, had, you have with you. And Exodus 18.11 says, let me pop up the little scripture here, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. That's Elohim, all the quote-unquote gods. It is translated judges in Exodus 21.6. Then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. So, hold on a second here. Um, I kind of lost my place. Okay, 
Uh, okay, I got it. Um, so here it's uh, it, it's translated. Uh, Elohim is translated judges. Again, it's it's translated here plural. Yep, I lost my uh, place again. It is translated angels, King James Version, or heavenly beings, NIV, in Psalm 8, 5. You have made them a little lower than the angels, Elohim, and crowned them with glory and honor. That is its plural use, and there is no evidence that anyone thought of these gods as having some kind of plurality of persons within themselves. Number two, Elohim is also translated as the singular God or judge. And there is no hint of any compound nature when it is translated that way. In other words, when it's translated in the singular, God or judge, it's not implying that this singular translation, God or judge, has some kind of hidden meaning uh, that there are more than one uh, God, but there is more than one God in these singular translations, or judge, more than one judge in these singular translations. Hope I explained that right. And there is no hint of any compound nature when it is translated that way. An example is Exodus 22. 20, which reads, whoever sacrifices to any God, Elohim, singular here, other than the Lord must be destroyed. Okay, so there's no implication that it's, there's any kind of hidden uh, compound meaning here that uh, this translation here, God, singular, is actually meaning more than one God within the one God. More than one God within the one God translation. <laughs> See how confusing the Trinity is? I'm starting to trip over my own tongue, my own brain. Other than the Lord must be destroyed. Another example is Judges 6.31. If Baal really is a God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. That's uh, Elijah there. Baal, its singular translation, is a god, Elohim. It's not implying here that Baal is more than one god, or three in one, or four in one, or two in one. He can't defend it. Okay, I already said that. I'm sorry. In Exodus 7 1, God says that he has made Moses a god, Elohim, to Pharaoh. No implication he was implying that Moses was more than one, was going to be like a type of more than one God, the Pharaoh. Again, in Judges 11.24, let me just read it. The pagan god Achimosh is called Elohim. 11.24, I can read it. Will you not take what your God Chemosh gives you? Singular. Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. The pagan god Chemosh is called Elohim, and in 1 Samuel 5, 7, the pagan god Dagon is called Elohim. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon, Dagon, our God. Okay. Translated singular, not implying some kind of hidden compound uh, triune being or two gods, three gods. I'm sure you get it. Okay. Get back to where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Uh, the pagan god Dagon is called Elohim, yet Christians do not conclude that those gods were somehow composite or uniplural, or that the people who worshipped them thought they were. 
Exactly how to translate Elohim in 1 Samuel 2.25 has been debated by scholars. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against Yah, excuse me, the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Okay, has been debated by scholars. The question is whether Elohim in the verse refers to a human judge or to God. The King James Version says judge. The versions are divided between them, some translating Elohim as a man, others as God himself. The fact that the scholars and translators debate about whether the word Elohim refers to a man or God shows vividly that the word itself does not have any inherent idea of plurality of persons. If it did, it could be not be translated as God when referring to a pagan god or a judge when referring to a man. The evidence in scripture does not warrant the conclusion that the Hebrew word Elohim inherently contains the idea of a compound nature. Do you understand here? When it's translated singular, there's no hidden truth that the one God translation means more than one God, implies more than one God. Some teach that the word Elohim implies a compound unity when it refers to the true God. That would mean that the word Elohim somehow changes meaning when it is applied to the true God so that the true God can be a compound being. There is just no evidence of this. Look, Moses was not a Trinitarian. Jesus was not a Trinitarian and his disciples were not Trinitarians. Elijah was not a Trinitarian. The prophets were not Trinitarians. You've been fed a bunch of lies. The first place we should go for confirmation of this is to the Jews themselves. When we study the history... And the language of the Jews, we discover that they never understood Elohim to imply a plurality in God in any way. In fact, the Jews were staunchly opposed to people and nations who tried to introduce any hint of more than one God into their culture. Jewish rabbis have debated the law to the point of tedium down to the last shot and tittle, and have recorded volume after volume of notes on the law. Yet in all of their debates, there is no mention of a plurality in God. This fact in its, of itself ought to close the argument. In other words, this has never come up as a, as, as a debate in the history of the Jews. Brings up my, one of my favorite scriptures. Matthew thirteen fifty two. Scribes being called in, experts of the Torah, to uh, interpret a certain part of the Torah. This has never been a a uh, there's the Trinity, a triune God, a God of more than one being, of one God and more than one being has never been never been brought up. Uh, hey, how about uh, How about the Shema? I just didn't have this down, but I haven't said it in a long time. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, Yeshua Jesus asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Here's a chance for Jesus to show that he's God. Jesus answered him, the first of all. All the commandments is here, O Israel, Yahweh our God, the, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Notice, he didn't say you shall love us. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is what? One God, and there is no other but He. He didn't say you and He. He said He, and to love Him. He didn't say them, or you and He, or He and you. With all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. 34. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. There's only one God. No higher authority on the Hebrew language can be found that than the great Hebrew scholar uh, Jesenius. I hope I pronounced that right. He wrote that the plural nature of Elohim was for intensification and was related to the plural of majesty and used for amplification. Genesis states that the language has entirely rejected the idea of numerical plurality in Elohim. Whenever it denotes one God, it whenever it denotes one God, is proved especially by its being almost invariably joined with a singular attribute. The singular pronoun is always used with the word Elohim. I'll have to be the first to admit I barely passed high school. I had such a concentration problem. High school was boring. School was boring, except history. He'll explain his is genesis in here in a second a study of the word will show that genesis stated that the singular attributes such as he not they or i nor we always follows elohim furthermore when the word elohim is used to denote others beside the true god it is understood as singular or plural never as uniplural to us the evidence is clear god is not compound in any sense of the word he is the one God of Israel. Scripture contains no reproof for those who do not believe in a triune God. Those who do not believe in God are called fools. Psalm 14.1 In other words, what this Genesis was saying, uh, um, just, just uh, say the, the, the Shema, there's a scripture. The, the Lord our God the Lord our God, the Lord our Elohim, He is one. The, 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 what was written down in the Hebrew is not they are one. He is one. Okay. An example, I'm just throwing out an example. Those who do not believe in the quote fools, I already read that. Those who reject uh, Christ, Messiah, are condemned. Or they're judged. Scripture testifies that it is for doctrine, reproof, and correction, 2 Timothy 3.16. And there are many verses that reprove believers for all kinds of erroneous beliefs and practices. Conspicuous, conspicuous in its absence is any kind of reproof for not believing in the Trinity. Okay. There's no Trinity. There's no triune God. It's the head of the snake, Mystery Babylon. I don't think it really is the worst doctrine of all. The worst doctrines of all are annihilationism and eternal torture. There's no worse doctrine. No worse smear on the one and only Holy God. All right, that's the uh, end of this short video. 19 minutes for me. That's pretty short. Hopefully in the next couple days I'm going to get part three of the Synagogue of Satan. I'm going to, read, uh, I'm going to just uh, play a video. Mm, there's 119 Ministries. Uh, uh, what's going to happen to all those resurrected in the second resurrection? This is why I believe that they are the Synagogue of Satan. They... Uh, they believe that the, those raised in the first resurrection are going to take part in Torah trial to exterminate everyone in the second resurrection. 
That is the uh, complete destruction. That is the, that is the uh, work of the devil. I just thought I'd mention that. I've been busy around the house, and I'm going to be uh, busy for, for the next couple of months, so, but I'm going to try to get back into this more. Uh, thank you here for your time, and thank you for listening.